Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to our program for this month. Uh, we've got a renowned author with us, a professor of Native American Studies from the University of Wisconsin. She's got some of her books here. She is not a genealogist. I have to, that was what I had to say. You might want to throw me out. But she has a wealth of knowledge that she's going to share with us related to doing genealogy and tracking down stories and history and families uh, on the Native American side and some of the different things that can be done and some amazing things that she's found over the years. So with that, I'll turn it over to Teresa Shank to present her amazing findings for us. I'll say <laughs> <that>. <laughs> I hope so. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so many of you for coming. This is not the usual night for your meeting, so I'm really happy to be here. And that so many of you came. It makes it worthwhile my eight hour drive from now <laughs> <laughs> to the winter. Um, and um, this is about the voice, the loudness that I can get. So if it needs to be louder, we'll have to use a microphone. Does it need to be louder? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It needs to be louder? Mm -hmm. Oh, it take it out. Here. I don't know if I should sing or talk. <laughs> um, as uh, I'm not, I'm not a genealogist, but I've had a lot of success in doing genealogy because I'm a historian. And my interest has been so much in, uh, in the people that I research. So I want to start with how I got interested in this. And that is, I inherited somehow a box of family pictures. And I had to find out, it was my job to find out who everyone was and what they did. So that's what got my interest going in genealogy. And actually, this is one of the pictures that I inherited, and you can't, probably can't see it really well. But this woman is my great-great-grandmother. And that's her sister and her sister-in-law and her sister-in-law's son. No, terrible Blair. What? Well, I know there's a Blair, but I don't know what to do about it. <laughs> We're just lucky to have this because oh, I always see Dr. Right. So that's just an example of one of the pictures that I had and had research. So this happens to be um, a book I wrote for the Ojibwe. Uh, mo it's mostly concerns the Ojibwe of Western Lake Superior, but a lot of them are from uh, this area, from Sault Ste. Marie and Mackinac as well. And it was uh, it was written. Let's see the title. Um, based on the Treaty of 1837. But I will tell you about that later. That's not what this is about. I just wanted to tell you how I got into genealogy. <clears throat> and then I got interested so much so that I, uh, in the Kadat family, and one of the first things I wrote on the Kadat family was this article that some of you may have seen. Because some of you may know, and certainly you should know, that we are the first family of Sault Ste. Marie. We were the first people ever living here as a family of the dots. And so we get a little bit upset when everybody gets excited about the chance. They came, what, 40 years later? <laughs> Just showing us that. <laughs> I think what I want to stress here is the importance of checking all records. Never to go by one finding. That you have to look and look and look. And I'm going to go over all the things I have looked at, all the all the sources for the movie. That's too distracting. <laughs> all the sources you have to look at in looking at genealogy if you want to come up with something more than just names. To me, genealogy is not making a list of names and dates and baptisms and marriages and deaths and cemeteries. 
It's about finding out about people, about who they were, what they did. Um, not just about their children, but in studying a single person, you have to study them in relation to their brothers and sisters, their parents, aunts, uncles. Three, I, I say three generations at a time. You have to study. And then the more you study, the more you will find out about that person. So what I'm going to tell you about is all the records and deeds and sources that I have used in uh, working with the genealogy I have done. Right. The first thing we all know about is census records, and that's the first place we go. Well, the Ojibwe were not always included in the early census records, were they? That distracting. <laughs> this is like being a teacher, you can't leave anything out. <laughs> okay. Are we paying attention now? <laughs> All right, so the first thing we look at is census records, and we know that um, the Ojibwe are not included uh, early on in census records. There are some in the 1827 record from here at Sault Ste. Marie, but they are mixed bloods, what we call mixed bloods. At that time, they were called half-breeds, and they are in that. Am I right, um, Susan, the, uh, you have the 1827 record for Sault Ste. Marie? I believe so, yes. And that's really valuable. Not many cities have a census record that early. But the thing is, it doesn't tell who are the mixed bloods and who are the non-mixed bloods. But that was very important at that time. <laughs> uh, important because, so as you know, there was a big court case in 1824 whether mixed bloods are allowed to vote or not. Are they citizens or not? It's a, it's a very interesting case, and it, and it uh, days right here from Sault Ste. Marie. Am I right that everybody would know about this? Is this it right? mm. No. 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 Oh, okay. I didn't bring any information on it because it's, you can find it. But, I mean, it's in, it's in records. But um, apparently, nine men voted in an election and they were mixed bloods. Ooh, they should not, perhaps they should have been voting. So there was a, a big investigation into it and then they had to decide whether these mixed bloods could vote or not. And some of the, the conditions were, well, he dresses like a white man and he lives in a house and he works. So he can vote, he's a white man. <laughs> but depending on what he looked like, then we might consider him an Indian and then his vote has to be discounted. It was really, an, it's an interesting case that went all the way, if not to the Supreme Court, it certainly went to Congress somehow, it went pretty far. All right, so back to the census records. <coughs> so, you know, you, I don't have to really talk about census records because I'm sure Susan and all of your authorities know everything. <laughs> but what I was going to show you that you may not be aware of, <coughs> we're talking about, I thought we were talking about Ojibwe genealogy, Ojibwe genealogy, is that in, in 1857, um, there was a, treaty payment, annuity payments given here at Sault Ste. Marie. And this is, this is a huge packet, but this is a packet of all the Ojibwe who claimed in that treaty. Now unfortunately it doesn't give their ages, but it does give their names, and there's a separate list for the mixed bloods. So this is, to me, the very first thing you look at that's, that's independent of a census record. It's kind of an Ojibwe census record, but it's really an annuity or treaty payment. Now, I'll stop periodically, and you can ask questions. What's the date you said? 1857 on this one. Yes. Probably Susan can ask this. Do we have copies of that document? They will. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was how the something started. I, I said that I have a lot of things that I would like to give to the library here, and so um, I came to bring them up. And then she said, did you talk? Yes, I talk. So <laughs> these things will be in the library. What did you call that document again? Mm -hmm. Annuity. Annuity. Annuity payments. Mm -hmm. Every year, by treaty, the US government had to pay so much money to each person. <coughs> I'm sure it you can see that part of it's cut off. It's been eaten. I didn't do it. It's that way in the record. <laughs> but down here, this is what they look like. So you have the name. You can see second from the bottom, Zoe Russo. And then the, the numbers are for adult males, adult females, and children. 
and then the total amount of money that person got. And these payments were for 1901. That was the big payment for that year. I need a place to put all these things. Chair. 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 Now, in addition to um, annuity records, which are really prominent, but this is the only one I found for Sault Ste. Marie. Um, there are other annuity records for the rest of Lake Superior, and especially for Minnesota. And something really interesting happened in 1877-78. The Bureau of Indian Affairs ordered a census, they called it a historical census, of the Ojibwe in 1877-78. That, if we could find it for Sault Ste. Marie, would be invaluable mm -hmm. because they had to list not only the name of each person, each person now, not just children like, but the name of each person, their parents and grandparents mm -hmm. and great-grandparents have known. Mm -hmm. I mean, this wow. is... Wow. <laughs> yes. And we have it for La Coudre, we have it for Fond du Lac, we have it for Bad River, we have it for La Pointe. I have never found the one for, for here. So I'll keep looking. Other people can keep looking because this is so invaluable. Now the next thing, after census records, the next thing are church records. Now we know the importance of church records, but especially are important the church records of St. Anne's and Mackinac. Mm -hmm. Do you have these at all? Well, we had a CD-ROM, which doesn't work anymore, so I, no, I don't think it's going to Was it a typewritten, or was it the actual manuscript? We had a CD-ROM, an actual disc, that doesn't operate on our computers anymore. So I'm not sure we have any paper copies. I don't think so. Well, what's available is not complete. Some of it is still in the hands of Spain. Uh, Father Alois took his back to Spain. He was well, French. Why would he take it to Spain? <laughs> because he was Spanish. He was a Spanish Jesuit, and he took it home with him when he was done playing here. There's, there's some Mackin Island document. I don't know if it was the Dwight Kelton stuff or uh, one of the armor books or something that went well, in quite Well, this is the record of Saint Je of Saint um, Saint Anne's in Mackinac. Yeah. I I have the the complete microfilm of it, and one of my jobs in the next two years is to translate it and to make it available. <laughs> so you will have the records from 1696 when we were actually I think nothing was being done. Uh, 1696 to about. 1840. And this is just a page to show you what it was like. Uh, this is from the around 1832, I think. 1830. Is it 1830? I can't even tell now. But um, these are wonderful records because the, the Catholic Church always demanded that they give the, the mother's name and the children and sometimes brothers and sisters. The, the records are so full. As you can see, this is just one record, one baptism record. Yeah. So um, instead of giving you the microfilm, which I need myself to do my work, that within two years you will have the, the actual transcription with the translation for everything. Can I ask why you chose the, to give it to this library? It's Mackinac, and so so much is Sault Ste. Marie. But I will I will also have to give one to a few other Ojibwe communities. So many Ojibwe are on here. This is the um, the Corbin family who is from Lac Coudre. But you, you have to read it really carefully. But when you get into the seven, around 1750s, you have Jean Baptiste Cadot's marriage record. You have his children's record. But I want to do it not just with the the. Um, the names and the translation. I want to do with an explanation of who sued, where, where other records are. I want to annotate it. I'm an annotator, as you will see from my books. I annotate everything. <laughs> Will it be placed in the St. Ignatius Library? No. No. <laughs> they, they want no, to buy I mean, it. We would yeah, like they want to buy it. it. Sure, sure. They want. Any, anyone wants yeah, to buy it. We're not too proud. Yeah, <laughs> well, and it's very valuable. The Saint Ignace Mackinac should have it. 
um, Mackinac City probably with the uh, well there's a very the Mackinac excellent Park. state library yeah. there that can be yeah. placed in Mackinac um, City. Somebody has translated this but it's a poor translation and a lot of mistakes in it. It was published in the uh, Wisconsin Historical Society papers. Mm -hmm. It's not good. Don't go 100% buy it. And it like so many times I see people translating records and they huh. they don't say everything and sometimes they, they don't say something because uh, they think it's going to hurt somebody well I think something mm -hmm. that happened 200 years ago is it going to hurt somebody today and it should all be out there and so this is what I intend to do this is my my new project <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say that there are other marriage re registers that are published. I'm sure you have them, right? Uh, I think LaPointe. Church records, LaPointe. LaPointe, um, I'm not sure about others. Do you, do, is that a transcription or is it the actual? Transcription. Um, yeah. It all depends on who does the transcription, how accurate it is. And I know the, tra I know the transcriber of that one. And, and there are some mistakes, but it's still pretty good. Something that um, recently has come to light <coughs> are the missionary records. St. Anne's Detroit also has missionary records for Sault Ste. Marie. These are in the St. Anne's register. A friend of mine in Madison got a copy of that and transcribed them all. And so I'm going to give you that his transcription too. Cool. And so here, uh, this is what they look like. Um, Father Baden, okay. and this is from 1825, and the other one is Father Father Gabriel Richard. Okay. So these records have been kind of hidden. They were done at both Green Bay and Sault Ste. Marie and Mackinac. The priest from St. Anne's Detroit would come up here for uh, a month or two in the summer to get some of the beautiful sunshine and fudge on Mackinac Island. <laughs> Isn't the fudge at Sault Ste. Marie too? I haven't seen that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, they would come up here and spend a short time and they would visit uh, Green Bay uh, Sault Ste. Marie and Mackinac and do baptisms. Mm -hmm. And so these now have been transcribed by my friend at the, uh, he's a genealogist at the uh, Wisconsin State <coughs> Historical Society and he's given me this to give to you. Okay. Okay. Do you have this already? No. I didn't think so. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> of course you have St. Mary's. St. Mary's Baptist <laughs> Memorial, yes. yes. Kathy Hendricks here was involved in that. Um, I once transcribed parts of those myself and found out. You have to read the whole record because there's so much interesting in information between the lines. Like one of my favorites was uh, when, uh, was it Angelique Cado? No, Archange Cado and uh, her Gurno husband were married by, and if you read through the whole thing, it says by consent according to Indian custom, which is not always in the transcription, but that's the, the correct way of marrying, by consent, by Indian custom, not by a priest. Mm -hmm. And the marriage was just as good and valid as any other marriage. And of course, you mentioned you have St. Joseph's LaPointe. Yes. And you probably have the records from um, the Keweenaw. Aunts, Lons. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Lons has them too. So these are the major church records that I think uh, cover this area. Can, what can about Larbra Croche? I mean, how much connection do we have? Larbra Croche also, yes. Okay. You have a big connection here, especially for the Odawa, right. who are, many Odawa intermarried here, mm -hmm. and Tara and Manitou and I. And I should also mention um, Garden River. Okay. Oh, yeah. Because the Garden River records are also important. Mm -hmm. So the, the church records, they are just so complete with information besides who married who and when. All right, so in addition, I think you must know about the Mackinac Register. The marriage Some, register? Yes. Mm -hmm. I have this. Um, after a pre 
priest married somebody at Mackinac Island, then he had to record the marriage in the civil record. And that's the Mackinac record, which is located at St. Ignace. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. This is what it looks like. So, um, so I didn't even pick a good one there. Did I pick somebody who wanted to see there? Well, here's one. Um, the Grignon who married a Barassa. Okay. Now, these you can get yourself. And do you have it in the records here? Um, I'm not I sure. With the lights off? No, I can't do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just trying to. Well, we're lucky that I can, we can at least show that much. That's all right. Um, these are after, <coughs> after the priest married the person at the church, St. Anne's, St. Anne's Church. He would go and to the uh, to the civil record and record the marriage, keeping in mind that many times he did he forgot to record them. Mm -hmm. So sometimes a marriage can be recorded in one place and not recorded in another, and vice versa. Some are, of course, um, civil marriages that were not done by a priest are also in here. So a justice of the peace or a non-Catholic uh, minister would record them in here anyway. <coughs> so right where in St. Ignace would that be? At the courthouse. Okay. You ask for the Mackinac Register, volume one. I don't know if they're letting people look at it anymore, are they? If you, if you can't get it, you can let me know because I, I didn't bring it because I was so sure you would have it here or know about it. They did four years ago when I was there. Yeah. I, I know they told me they were tightening up on it because it's really fading out. And there are a lot of other things in that register besides marriage uh, records. There are also um, uh, civil records of different kinds. Right. The next important thing we look at in um, genealogy and Indian genealogy are treaties. Treaties are extremely important and people forget about them. So let me sh show you something here. <laughs> the first treaty that has anything of import is the Treaty of 1826, the Treaty of Fond du Lac. And at the end of this treaty, there is a list of people who were to get land, mixed bloods or, or uh, children of Indians and, and uh, white people, and they were to get land, but the treaty, this part of the treaty was never passed by the Senate, so it didn't really happen. But the names are there, and the interesting thing is the Indian names of the women, instead of, we don't know their white names unless you know genealogy. So I want to show you something here that really is of interest. Can you see that? Not very well. Can you make it larger? Actually, it's a two page list at the end of the treaty. And you must have footnote here, do you? As a genealogical tool? Footnote? No. Okay, footnote um, are, are the original trees. And in this tree, I'm going to have to read it because you can't see it otherwise. I'm just going to show you a caution. Well, here, here is one that is definitely from Sue St. Marie. Here. To each of the children of Eustace Roussain, I'm sure you've all heard the name Roussain here in Sault Ste. Marie, mm -hmm. had one of the really early exciting yeah. court cases. Yes, yeah, so we had an interesting court case for raping somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, he wasn't the one who raped, but it's the family. 
Anyway, um, to each of the children of Eustace Ruth saying bye, and they list the name of three Indian women. One section. Yeah. Now that's the kind of thing in this part of the treaty. So you finally get the women's names. But what I wanted to show you, how you can't rely on everything, To each of the children of Sagamake, widow of Jean Baptiste Cadot Jr., and then this the three the five children. All right, the five children are I guess I have to find it, don't I? Period. Okay. To Sagamaka, widow of Jean Baptiste, the late Jean Baptiste Cadot, and to each of her children, and they mention Louison, Sophia, Archangel, Edward, and Polly. Mm -hmm. And this has always been taken as her five children. They are her five children, but they aren't Jean Baptiste Cadot's <laughs> five children. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that kind of thing you have to really watch out for in these documents because only three of them are her children by Jean-Baptiste Cadot. The other two are her children by affairs she had right here in Suez. This is a, you've got an exciting history here. One of her children, Polly, is by Louis Johnston. Oh, God. Sophie puts out. Yes, yes, and the other one, so she has two children by two different people. Now, at one time, it was, since they both took the name Johnston, it was thought that they were both Johnstons. But one of them is by the, the neighbor. You know, we're. we're uh, <laughs> <laughs> you have to read my article. Isn't my article in that book on, on, uh, on the Johnston family? And the Johnston family uh, put out a thing. They said, well, we're going to publish a book on, the, uh, on all the members of the family, but we're not going to be able to include Lewis Johnson because we don't know anything about him. Mm -hmm. And I saw that, and I said, hey, I know a lot about him. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote him and said, I, I know something. He said, you should write an article. He's not related to me. Sure, I'll write the article. And so I, this is what came out in the article about Polly and Sophie and who their parents, who their fathers are. So uh, Mrs. Cadot, who was called affectionately Madame Cadot, had uh, an affair with Lewis Johnson before his father sent him off to the Navy. He meant that he sent him off to the War of 1812. And then she had an affair with the next door neighbor. And I forget his name. Sure. What are the old names? Nolan? No, no. Nolan. Dubois? Dubois? Oh, I, I, I can get it for you tomorrow. Yeah, it's it's another, I don't have time to look it up right now, but, <laughs> but it's another, because um, if you really look at those names on the 1821 map, I can tell you who it is. The 1821 map is the people right next door to the Cadots. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, <laughs> the um, schoolcraft and his family and the Johnstons really took it really hard. That she, that, that they're, the oldest son had an affair with this lowly woman, <laughs> and uh, they made a big thing out of it. They, they, in fact, they they accepted her into their house. It's part of so they accepted her into their house as a servant, but they wouldn't treat her like a daughter. And it's a whole wonderful long story of um, prejudice. <laughs> So that's I, the, my warning here is just be careful when you hear somebody the children of somebody. It doesn't mean that they're children of that father too. <coughs> Next, <coughs> oh, the Treaty of 1836. That is another exciting treaty. And it, for those of you who have Odawa ancestry, <coughs> that it is very important. In the, in the Treaty of 1836, money was allotted to mixed bloods. And um, the, uh, 
mixed bloods had to register and also declare their parentage, where they were born, all this information. So we have a list from that treaty, which I'm giving to the library. This is how the whole thing started, I think. I said, don't you have a list of that treaty? <laughs> Can we make it smaller? I'm not very mechanical. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just move it around. So in this in this tree, everybody had to register, so you can see over here the names. Where are they from? Sault Ste. Marie. Their ages. And that one half C means one half Chippewa. And then um, you go farther over how much money you're going to be allotted in the treaty. But then comments. So comments are often about the parentage. So this is a very valuable addendum to a treaty. <coughs> where did I find this? In the National Archives in Washington, where I do a lot of my research. Right? There's a lot of stuff in there. Um, but you need the, the time and the... My eyesight's already failed me, I think, because of all the research I've done. But this I will give to them, but there's also people who are not patient with manuscripts, there's a transcription. Uh -huh. <laughs> Don't just believe the transcription. Look up the original. <laughs> okay, so this is a very valuable tool, especially for Ojibwe genealogy. Because it, it contains, some of them are part of Ojibwe. So this is one half C, Chippewa, one half O, Al-Udal, not Ojibwe. Another, that, that tree, by the way, is a really interesting piece of work because it was decided to give $150,000, but it was decided to divide up the, um, the Indians three ways into half-breeds. Half-breeds are the first class, the second, have you heard this? First class, second class, and third class. And each class would get a different amount of money. Of course, Schoolcraft's relatives were all decided to be in the first class. <laughs> and they got most of the money. <laughs> and um, that, that also shows in here, that it's, it's listed what class they're in. Are you excited to go to Ojibwe genealogy now? <laughs> okay. The next uh, treaty, eighteen thirty seven was a treaty of the point. But the, the mixed blood for that treaty uh, were any Chippewa who had not been allotted in the Treaty of eighteen thirty six. So a lot of them claimed from Mackinac, Sault Ste. Marie, and then La Pointe. Those were the main areas of taking affidavits. And these affidavits were declared um, at, at the cities I told you. And then it had to be decided if they were deserving, if they were um, really related to the people they claimed. So I found these affidavits in the uh, University of Michigan Library, uh, the, the Clements Library actually, in the Lyon Papers. And I wrote this book, <coughs> All Our Relations, <coughs> in the Treaty of 1837, in which I list, I'll just show you an example here, um, J. Child. And then the first part at the top is the actual document that was written when he made his declaration of being, uh, of deserving money. So that would be first, and then below it is my research on what I could find out about him. Now, I must confess that I didn't do a lot of work on the Sault Ste. Marie people, <laughs> being that most of my relatives were from La Pointe. But it, I still did some, I want to be honest with you. I did some on each one. So um, here you can see what I can The name Chevalier. All right, the top part is from the actual document. And then my research, and then other comments at the bottom. So this is valuable if you have a relative who was in that treaty, who was mentioned in that treaty. There's also a list of all the names, and I think I gave one of these to Susan, didn't I? Mm -hmm. So Susan has this. Um, I also sell them, they're, they're $15 each, and I only have like five left, and then I have to have the fourth edition reprinted. 
Mm. So it's it's sold very well with the um, with the Ojibwe all through Minnesota and uh, Wisconsin. Mm. And I'm not here to sell it. I'm just telling you about it. But if if people want it, they can order it. If, if there aren't enough to go around, uh, you can order it from me, and I will have a new edition printed in about a month. And I'm telling you that fifteen dollars is exactly what it costs to print. <laughs> and um, but if I have to send it to you, then it's twenty dollars because. I have to. Yeah. Any? Do you want to ask any questions about this? Of course, that's why my great great grandmother's on the cover. <laughs> and there are there are pictures that I could find of about nine of the Ojibwe in this one. Um, there are actually a few more I found, but they cost too much to reprint because if somebody holds the rights to them, they don't let you reprint them. So the ones that they let me go on are in here. Yes? Yes. Oh, I thought somebody had a question. Yes. Question. Now, I know later on they separated the Minnesota and Wisconsin from Michigan so that you had Chippewas and Northern Lake Superior and you know, basically two treaty groups. Was that in effect back in 36 and 37? No, the, that, um, 37 was actually with all the Minnesota and Wisconsin. A different Virginia. district then. They were yeah, a different they were treaty. distinguishing them, yeah. Okay. And That's later right. on they did distinguish them. But you don't have this genealogical information later on. Yeah, in the, in the later I mean, it was very valuable, and actually that was Mackinac territory at yeah. that time. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm mm -hmm. trying to... Yeah, that's right. Uh, I just want to show you, this is, this, is, this is a picture of Kerbasa. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he was over at um, Loss. Am I saying that right? Loss? How do you say it? Loss. 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 <laughs> so that's Kerbasa and his wife, Nancy. Of course, the pictures are much older. They're much older in the pictures than when the treaty was made because there was no photography in 1837. Yeah. And I didn't allow anyone to be in here unless the, their, the picture had to correspond with the, the uh, document. Um, excuse me. Did you give a year for the affidavits? Affidavits were 1839. It took them a while to get them all together. Thank you. That there are, I believe, 200, uh, there are 800 and some claimants and about 204 affidavits, because one affidavit would serve for several people, for the family. But, um, and then only about half were allotted, were, were allowed money, because a lot of the people came from all over. People came from up in Canada and declared to be born on uh, Wisconsin soil or something. And the, the chief said, no, they weren't. The chiefs had the last word for everybody not the uh, treaty commissioner. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay. So we're going to go here. So the treaties. Now, next major source, fur trade records. Oh, these are wonderful. And this is another way I got into uh, Ojibwe genealogy was looking at fur trade records and trying to figure out who's who <laughs> and who they were married to and where they came from. So the fur trade records are immense, but a great source if you have the patience and if you read French. <laughs> so let me start with this. Order. Well, I'm just going to say, talk about the, the fur trade records. I, I'm not going to, if I can find the pictures, I'll show you. I did bring the pictures of everything, I just can't find them. <laughs> sorry, sorry about this. Okay, the first are the licenses. Starting in the mid 1600s, Frenchmen in Canada which was not yet Canada, by the way, New France, um, were able, 
excuse me, we're able to get licenses. And those licenses will tell where they're from and um, where they were going. Now, some of these people stayed there. Not many, but, but early on, many, some did stay. But they, you have to follow them through the records. So licenses are the first way of um, identifying people. Next would be something called an engagement, where you, uh, this is the uh, contract between somebody who enters the fur trade and the company he works for. So I have some samples here to show you, but the engagement will also tell you the, the person's name and where he's from. After that, we start having lists. At the beginning, we don't have lists, but later on, we do have lists of fur traders. And this is starting in about 1775. We have the Northwest Company list. Then later on, we have um, not so much for here, the Hudson Bay Company, but it wasn't down here so much, very little. And uh, then later, the American Fur Company. So I'm going to show you some of those lists if I can actually find them. This is a list of people that was at Fond du Lac, the East, uh, Western Lake Superior, in 1832. But a lot of them are from this area. A lot of them are from Eastern Lake Superior or from Lake Huron. Now, we don't know it just from looking at their names, but you, uh, but you have to use other records for this. Um, this list, <coughs> for instance, Cote. The Cotes are from Sault Ste. Marie. Are you familiar with that name at all? Yeah. Pierre and Henry Cote. Pierre Cote was actually from Mackinac, and his children uh, were fur traders in the West. Some of them came back. One of his uh, sons married a Gurno. The Gurno is a big name here. So these are things you just have to put together all the time. You know the Gurnos? Uh, yeah. yeah, they shoot each other. Yeah. Well, Over the name and the states. The Gurnos are related to us, too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they sued each other? The Cote family was the first family of the of Francis Cornell, the informant on the treaties in the 1850s. Yeah. A lot of great stories here. You just got to write them down. And <laughs> okay. there's, some, there's another list here. Now, so <coughs> you remember the first time probably the second time I ever met you, I was looking for this list. This is the Samuel Abbott Register. Wonderful list of people who were um, working in the fur trade. But these are just names until you start working with them. But it's almost like you make a card for each person. You make a card and every piece of information you find out about them. And then you can't tell whether it's really the same person. So you have to keep back checking because, especially with those Frenchmen, you know, they couldn't vary their names. How many Jean Baptistes are there? <laughs> just so many names. But, um, Susan, just in case you don't have this, I made you a whole copy of the Abbott. Do you have it? It, it went missing. Maybe I took it. <laughs> We may you'll, have, you'll have it back. Thank you. And, you know, you really have to go with this with, with clear eyesight and clear mind because it, it's not as hard to read as it looks to you up here. Believe me. <laughs> and then there, there are other uh, lists like uh, fur trade, um, fur traders on the left hand side and where they went. And you have to go down the list, but you can see, I think at the bottom of this list, you have. Grand, well, Grand Island is close to here. By this time, you don't have. This is Sault Ste. Marie. Yep. Well, yeah. Second one. Mm -hmm. So all of these lists will have somebody who comes from this area. But even if they're from another area, even if they're from Fond du Lac, like the Cotes, they really belong here. They're from here. You just have to put them together and connect them.
Okay, so like I said, you have the papers, the, the fur trade papers, first of all, in the Canadian archives, they are licenses and um, voyageur uh, engagement. You have uh, the Northwest Company lists, you have, and engagement, you have the American Fur Company lists. And by the way, the American Fur Company records are so rich. Here in Sault Ste. Marie, you have a, Susan, what is it? You've got an American Fur Company letter book, is it? We, we do, well, in the on microfilm as well as yeah. The originals, yeah. yeah. So they have something here, Mackinac has something, Mackinac Park has something. These records are rich, they are all over. They may not tell genealogy, but they tell you where people are at a certain time. And if you're doing genealogy to create people and make them alive, you need these records because they come alive when you find out what they did, where they went, what they bought. Wait till you see the kinds of things they bought, how much liquor they bought. <laughs> <laughs> and then of course there are letter books. I think you also have letter books here. Yes. Uh, American Fur Company letter books. Mm -hmm. Letter books give a lot of information. A lot of the information is in the New York Historical Society. The American Fur Company records are all there. Um, I can't even overstress. The, the use of the, the fur trade records, which is really what I've used so much of. And finally, the Mackinac School records. The Mackinac School was in uh, 1824 to about 1832. The records are kept in Boston. <laughs> but these are all on microfilm, you can send for them. The, they're called the ABCFM, the American Board of Commissioners of Foreign Missions. Their records are on microfilm. It's only about 800 reels, I think, so you really need the guide to find out which reel you want. But they have two lists of students in the Mackinac School in 1824 to 1832, and a lot of them up in Sault Ste. Marie. <laughs> and in these, uh, in these school records of the ABCFM, they also tell, for instance, they'll say one quarter Chippewa, one half Chippewa. They'll, they'll tell you more about the person. They give the name of the parents, one parent. They never include women because they're Protestant church records. Okay, other resources for this. And this is going to, going to other, to books to find out. I have found, Great wealth in the schoolcraft papers, Henry Schoolcraft papers. Do you, do you have these at all? We have some copies of them from elsewhere. No, they're about, I think there's 64 reels of schoolcraft records. And um, they are invaluable. If you, once you know the date and what you're looking for, you, you read the letters of that time, and you, find, you even find them in his works in 1851. He wrote two, he published two works in 1851. And um, Personal Memoirs has a lot of information. He has very good stories about people right here. At, oh, the Sioux stories are wonderful about, about burials and you know, he's living here. So he has great um, stories, you know, schoolcraft papers. Also, a missionary here was Abel Bingham. Abel Bingham. And his papers are at Central Michigan University. Um, and right here you have the Barbeau papers. What's the other? You have one other really big one. Uh, that I've used. The Port Mackinac Papers and the American Fur Company and Barbeau. One by a, a, a person's name. Hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah. That's, okay. that's what I wondered. But. Uh, and then, of course, the... Barrica? No, Barrica Papers are down at uh, Marquette. Okay. <clears throat> they're somewhat useful. Yeah, they, yeah they're, they're somewhat useful, but not a whole lot. Is, uh, the Berga papers are letters that he wrote mostly about begging for money. <laughs> <laughs> Not much about the, the native people. Um, the Johnston. The, the Johnston papers. Um, again, they're here, but they, he doesn't give a lot of information about the people. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to show you is where to find information about the people that we don't know. And to do genealogy, you need, first of all, the census and <coughs> church records are, are primary importance. But like, I, I was looking, um, I had read in history books that um, Pierre Cote, the elder guy, was um, a mixed blood. And it just didn't sit well with me. He did not 
re did not read like a mix, but so I went to Canada. I went to uh, Quebec, uh, no, actually Montreal, and I found the Cote family papers. And I looked to see what his signature was like. I found his signature in 1798, and then I found his signature when he came out here to make sure it was the same person that I had. And he wasn't. He was a, a Frenchman who came out here, who learned Ojibwe so well, who married two Ojibwe women, probably two at the same time, <laughs> and, and had children by them. And he convinced people. A lot of people thought he was um, Ojibwe, but he wasn't. So many times you really have to do all this research to find out information, and you don't take one source. You don't take one historian. You don't even take me as one source, although I'm pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you always uh, uh, look for things. You look for other sources. And uh, I'll, I'll give you, for instance, can I have that book right there? This really doesn't apply very much to Sault Ste. Marie, but, but this is a book that I just completed this year. And this one is full of fur traders. And I had I, I annotated a journal. And this in this journal I annotate, oh, P, uh, Pierre Cote is in here, he plays a big part, Berg is in here. Uh, but um, what I had to do is, what I was interested in is finding out more about each person. So I did a lot of research from all of these fur trade records to find out about the person, uh, his wife, the wives are in here, sometimes the names of the Indian women are in here. However, the focus is largely on, on Dulac, mm -hmm. not on Sault Ste. Marie. He did pass through Sault Ste. Marie, he described Sault Ste. Marie a little bit, but uh, it's not a Sault Ste. Marie genealogy, but I just wanted to tell you, this is the, the kind of work I do, it's really important for the history and the person itself, and why I had to know genealogy <coughs> to identify every person in here. And there's hundreds of persons. Okay, I have spoken for 50 minutes. 50 minutes now. Fifty-one. Okay. 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 Do you have any pointers for uh, Canadian uh, Ojibwe research? Because they wouldn't have the trees. Right? Where? Uh, where? Bell River, Ontario. Is that, that's on this side? It's that's south of uh, Windsor, south yes. of Detroit. Um, I love the Canadians because I'm part Canadian too. But you know, the, um, the Protestant missionaries did not keep the records that the Catholic missionaries did. And so I really don't know that much about uh, Ojibwe genealogy over here, but I just know that it's not as accurate or full, not as complete. The Garden River might be better. I don't. I stumbled on this. I'm sure other people have too. Maybe Mary, that genealogy that looked like one of the Jesuit ministers who was over in Garden River and up the way. Yes, they've done. They've yeah. done some work. Over it's there. all in French again. <laughs> but it's yeah, online. The, the Jesuits were, were pretty good, and the Jesuits did some genealogy over Thunder Bay too. But, but it's still you have to read their letters to get the good stories. Yeah. Fort William records are. That's what I would do. Not for Thunder. For Thunder. <coughs> Is there a place in Garden River where you can read these things? Probably the church, but I don't know if they let you in. <laughs> Did the Robinson the safe was treaties stolen, over there? Mm. I'm sorry. Mm. Did the Robinson treaties over there have any good information? 1850. I've never, I've never, I've seen the treaties and I haven't seen any good information in. Okay, I didn't and know if there were names. By, by a was. way of interest, this, to me this is very interesting. A bunch of Ojibwe <coughs> chiefs from Wisconsin and Minnesota, when they heard about this Ojibwe, the the, the, Gar the Robinson treaty, mm -hmm. they wrote a letter to the treaty commissioner to see if they could become Canadian Ojibwe. <laughs> <laughs> they thought there was going to be money given out. And it's kind of embarrassing, you know, because these are some of our big leaders and they all, they wanted to go to Canada just for the money. Yeah. One of the things in the Robinson Treaty is that they will say, okay, you're a half-blood or mm -hmm. something, but they don't give the try. That's right. That's what I was so yeah, they're, they're not, they're, like Cree or You yeah. got to go by the location. What, mm -hmm. tree, what yeah. Indians live there? Yeah. Where do you find that um, Robinson the Treaty? Uh, it's lots online, I think. No, yeah. 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 I was I was just at a treaty conference in October on Manitoulin Island. They have a big treaty over there, but they're they're doing a lot of genealogy on Manitoulin Island too, mm -hmm. mixing the Ojibwe and the uh, Odawa. Mm -hmm. so yes. Okay. Uh, most people don't realize this, perhaps, but when the treaties were signed, the treaty commissioners could not ask the person where they lived. 
So we will find dozens of people who sign Canadian treaties, so-called, and American treaties, both. <laughs> because they weren't signing them as Americans or as Canadian, they were signing them as Anishinaabeth. Well, um, most of the American treaties have, after the name of the person, they have their, their band is named in there. I don't have an example to show you, but uh, do you do you have the uh, Indian treaties at, in the library? Do we have that Manyani book? I looked online and it's now worth about six hundred dollars. So take good care of it. <laughs> It's all the treaties, but you can look in there and see that. But, but sometimes you can't read the names correctly. They're incorrectly <coughs> spelled. And you really have to know Ojibwe to be able to tell who that person is. The 1855 treaty says that uh, members of the Garden River Band are eligible for certain things. That's an 1855 U.S. treaty mm -hmm. that mentions the, the well, Garden they, River people. But they were right. from... They were from both sides, and we have yeah, to exactly. give them that. The, the exactly. Garden River people were just as much from this side as the other side, and they didn't live by that line. It was just the arbitrary line anyway. They all have relatives over here. You know that a lot of them I know today are working over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Garden River Church Index is online. Good. So. Maybe that's what I ran across. Is it in French? No. No? Okay, that isn't it. So that, they're not a French-speaking <laughs> community. The beginning of it is in Latin, I believe, and then the rest is in English. It's like the, it's like the bearer of uh, uh, records I start off in Latin. Mm -hmm. And he says, when I arrived here, I found a few French Canadians and a few mixed bloods, and the rest of the people were living in darkness and the shadow of death. <laughs> <laughs> That's America. <laughs> the beginning of his, of his register. Yeah, <laughs> Match the book with all the treaties in it. What's the name of that book? Indian Affairs, colon, Laws and Treaties, Volume Two. Okay, thank you. I think all that is online. It is, but it's not nearly. <coughs> as, it's much better than his. Yes. The, the online part. I, I've, I've been having to print them online, and they're not. It's not nearly as good. No. <coughs> well, we do now have online the Jesuit relations. Mm -hmm. in English. Wish our good historical background and yeah. not really genealogy. But what, what you mentioned something online. I was going to tell you something else. All the Fort William records you can get through the Mormons. Don't believe everything you read in the Mormons. <laughs> I have found so many mistakes on the Kadats especially. Oh my gosh. But I was going to tell you that uh, don't forget the, um, the uh, treaties. Indian treaties can be found online in their original form too. I think I think that's what footnote is. Footnote. Might be something when somebody gives you a big donation, you might look at that. <laughs> you know, it's like one of the uh, genealogies sections. Is there, is there anything else you want to add? I mean, I'm not. I I don't know even that near everything. Yeah, I've been corresponding with women in uh, Unising, and she's looking for information on Isidore Lacoy and his wife uh, Charlotte Kamusi. Um, do you have any information that you could share with her on, on where she could get more information? She sent me an email and she'd like to get your email address and correspond with you. Well, she must have looked already in uh, She has. Uh, he's, he uh, was, says he's from St. Constant, Quebec, uh, but all the records just say he was uh, you know, born in Lower Canada. Oh, wow. uh, which church uh, you know, he might have gone to, she's not sure, and can't find the records through the PRDH. Yeah, the, the Canadian records are very complete, but you know, I've gone to every church myself. I have not That's trusted true. those books that they publish, and I have found right. so much more by going to the church. But it, it's, you know, it's like a, a lifetime commitment. Oh, and yeah. I wasn't That's looking it. for genealogy, I was looking for history about the family. Why did, why did three members of the Kadat family die? Three generations die <laughs> within three weeks of each other. Mm -hmm. What did so you find out? They, there was a disease going around, and the, the, the uh, Mother had it first, and then the grandmother, and then the child. So these are the kinds of things I was looking at. Why did 30 young women, 16 to 18, die in one day? But you gotta go to the church to find out because they wrote everything. They tried to cross the St. Lawrence in the, on ice. So it, it helped, reading French really helps. 
but going, you have to go to the places too, but I know most of you can't go to the places or you can't make friends, so you do what you can. And um, that's all I can say. If you're not familiar with any further information no. in the fur trade records, on, he was a, a voyager. But he was late. <coughs> It was late. Late? Yes. It was after, it was post-1850. Uh, was it? Okay. I think. There's, there's I've a memorial in 1836. I don't. I, I think write that up. there might be some. Oh, you mean, on, you mean on the, on the, okay, you can look at that tree. You can look at that tree. Yeah. <laughs> okay, did you have something? Um, I was just wondering if you had any suggestions about where to look for marriage things like Sugar Island, Garden River, or Sault Ste. Marie area, I guess. It was here. Um, probably 1860s or 70s. Well, that should have been here. Okay. That's probably. Or Garden River, yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it's, to me, it's the earlier records I've always been most mm -hmm. interested in, the 1820s, 1830s, the Canadian records. But um, after 1850s, certainly uh, St. Mary's here was quite active. They weren't even going to back on that anymore. Well, I hope I've opened your eyes to some of the things you have to look at. And um, you know, if you ever, if there's anything I can ever help you with, you can always reach me. My, my last name is Shank, S-C-H-E-N-C-K, at wisc.edu, the WISC standing for Wisconsin. <laughs> EDU standing for University. And, um, you know, I, I don't have a lot of stuff, but whatever I have that, that, deal, that I'm sure deals with Sue St. <coughs> I'm giving to Susan. And then um, hopefully I'll, I'll be giving you the records of, of uh, St. Anne Mackinac. If I can get them done. That's shank at whisk.edu. Yes. And but we just have remember, I'm not a genealogist. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> we have the steer room that you can make an appointment and look at these records or signing for microfilm and we'd be glad to try to help. When will the records be available? Well, so you get the other person. Find locations, boxes. I have a question. Are, are they still publishing that St. Mary's Cathedral had a book with all the marriages from 1800 to 1900? Are they still publishing? That's books? not marriages, it's baptisms. Or baptisms. The, yeah. the marriages haven't been done yet. There were uh, just a couple of yeah. There were some. There were some marriages sure. that were found in the middle of the baptism books, and that's why we did that. We oh, oh okay, that. that's why you yeah. did that. Otherwise, okay. we thought when people went back to do the marriages, then they would never find them because they were stuck in the middle of the baptism. What happened? I thought they were going to come out with a marriage book. I don't know. <laughs> 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 Maybe they're still there. Maybe they're still there. I think we're at the point where we need to. Um, Break. Probably uh, scan them now because yeah. it's just the amount of work. You don't know the amount of work that goes into that. Mm -hmm. I think if, you, if you can scan them, that would be of greater value than right. Publishing. And that's what we we wanted to do all along, but didn't. Have and I thought of that for the St. Anne's records, but even scanned you saw them. <coughs> they would not be of any, of any value to many people. So I I do project to get this thing to start working on it come um, some. Maybe do a few pages a day. Have you seen any records from Holy Angels Church on Sugar Island? No, I've never seen the Holy Angels records. Where are they? Most they should be in Marquette. Are, most of them are housed in Garden River. Oh, okay. And, and Marquette has a lot of the church records also since that's the diocese. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they have that one. Mm -hmm. Sugar Island is in um, Garden River now. It's a mix of St. Mary's and Garden River, just depend on where the priest came back to after he was done. <laughs> yeah. There was a priest in 1933 wrote a list of if you're looking for a certain record, where to look for that record. So, like there's a little town north of Sault Ste. Marie, Canada called Batchewana. Mm -hmm. And for, you know, records in that place, you know, you should look in Wisconsin, you should look in, in uh, Marquette, you should look in St. Mary's, you should look in... Uh, Detroit. Precious blood, yeah. not Detroit, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, and Twin uh, Kong, Garden River, and all those because wherever the you know, 
I think they must have had students going out doing things in the summertime, and whoever was in charge of them, that's where the records got recorded. We need that record again, don't we? Yeah. Where'd you find yeah. that list? It's on uh, the, it's in two places. One is on the Garden River uh, Mormon film, and the other is on the Garden Village. Mm -hmm. So if you just remember Garden, mm -hmm. it's in <laughs> two places. Well, I, I, I hope, I hope I've helped you, and I really need to get any more, so huh? thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.